Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. My guest today is Rafi Green Greenberg. He is the Executive Director at Dialogue. Uh, welcome to the show. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so there's many ways we can go. I actually once asked us, uh, asked Francis Pedrasa, a previous guest as well, what is Dialogue? Uh, and this was actually like many years ago, as in not what you're working on, but like what is Dialogue itself? Um, what does it mean to Dialogue? What does it? What is a monologue? Are there any other options between between dialogue, monologue? Is there is there any trialogue? Trialogue, yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm watching a TV, TV series now called The Decalogue by Krzysztof Kieślowski. Have you heard of it? No. Can you pronounce pronounce it again? Decalogue. Deca Decalogue, as in Decalogue. ten. Decalogue. Um, it's like loosely based on the Ten Commandments, but it's just ten different stories. Oh, interesting. Uh, so so okay, let's go look up uh, Logue uh log etymology um from french and from greek logos okay so from the logos uh uh so what what what's your take on the logos what is logos i guess my take on what a dialogue is is two people sharing their inner worlds with each other Ooh. i like to say that basically yeah, i think we have eight billion people on the planet so there are eight billion and one different worlds there's the one inside each of our heads, and then there's the one that we share. And the one that we share is certainly the most important one because we share it, it's reality, uh, but there's something going on inside of each person. And it's kind of that old thought experiment of like, how do you know that everyone else is not a robot? I think the only way to sort of build up that confidence over time is through dialogue. Ooh, okay, uh, juicy territory. We could go into um, uh, whether you think these robots are now conscious uh, and whether the, because it, it's the same problem. And one of my previous guests talks about how basically what was just kind of like a philosophical question about whether we can uh, build consciousness with robots. Uh, like that used to just be kind of a, a passing fancy for philosophers, uh, but now it seems to be one of the most important questions on the planet. I certainly don't have an answer yet. I, I, I tend to believe that these are not conscious, um, but if you if you have any take on it, or uh, let me know. I think uh, it's possible to build a conscious thing. I just put the probability as low. I don't know if you've heard of the famous uh, thought experiment, Pascal's mugging. No. It's a variant on Pascal's wager. Um, and I used to go to some of these like effective altruist conferences. And so Pascal's mugging went like this, right? Somebody, a mugger comes up to an alley. But instead of threatening to harm you, he threatens to harm a virtual world that he created with lots of simulated conscious beings. And so he says something like, I have on this hard drive right here, a simulation of the world that's running. There are 8 billion conscious beings on it. And I, with the click of a button, I can make them suffer for thousands of years. Uh, but if you give me $5, I won't do it. <laughs> so... Yeah, you could do this with various amounts of money, various amounts of simulated conscious beings. But the question is, is it worth it? And it's interesting that, that effective altruists pose a thought experiment because it basically breaks the logic. It's like, well, if he says, I've got 10 zillion conscious beings, I can make them suffer for 10 zillion years. Is it really not worth $5? Um, and no matter how low you put the probability that these beings can actually suffer, he can make the number high enough that it becomes worth it. Uh, okay very interesting okay so i have an answer to this dilemma go for it which is basically i think the the higher the number of simulated beings the lower the probability that they're actually conscious because it takes oh. compute power oh. and so because one scales inversely with the other there's basically no number he could say at which i would believe him enough to be worth paying interesting so this is this gets into interesting territory because it's about the nature of information. I was just interviewing somebody yesterday about about the nature of information, and if we look at two hundred years ago, it, it was there was a high cost to transmitting information across the planet from one mind to another. Um, now there is a low cost, and now something about large language models includes information, and then there's another caveat about including knowledge as well, and and the difference between knowledge and information. Um, but it seems like the cost of compute is going to go way, way down. And so the cost of spreading information is going to also go way down. Um, do you think that that challenges your answer or not? Or not? Yeah, it's possible. Like, like if you think that Moore's law is going to keep happening indefinitely, like we could get to a point at this would, at, at a point which this would be a legitimate concern. Um, but I don't think we're like even close to it. Like if someone said this to me in Ali, I would not pay them $5 no matter what, what their claim was. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and so then bringing it back to our current world, 8 billion people, 
in our world, there is not only a cost for information, but it's also the cost of like having a human being on the planet with all the food and the water and all the other things that cost with it. So there's a huge amount of costs to each new person. Uh, this is super interesting territory. I guess I, I object to that. Go for it. I think that, yeah, the average uh, resources generated by a human being far exceed what they consume. Yes. And yep. the proof to me is just the story of like human progress, especially in the last 300-ish years. But basically there's been like a you know major, major correlation between um, human well-being, right? Which you could look at in terms of uh, GDP per person. You could look at in terms of lifespan, health span, all these things, and the size of the global population. Mm -hmm. I don't think it necessarily proves causation. It doesn't necessarily prove that each marginal additional human being is contributing to that. But given the correlation is so high, I'm a lot less worried about having fewer kids. I'd be way more worried about having uh, not enough kids. Yeah. yeah, it is so weird how like that's how somehow because there were a lot of eugenic movements in the 1920s and 1950s and all that like this pot not only in 1950s also in 1970s and 1980s a lot of our environmental movements come from this idea of the of the of that we're just going to be overpopulated and then through the sweet irony of history uh and and the future it's like it seems to be that it's actually the opposite and actually it's a problem um and it's going to be a bigger problem but then I think about robots coming in and, and kind of doing a lot of the jobs that we're apparently losing because of this. And we might find some beneficial equilibrium. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with it? What's your take on that? I think it's certainly possible. I mean, I think that story of human progress is also synonymous with the story of like using technology to make our lives better. Um, mm -hmm. It's not obviously up. There have been major downs as well. And I guess it's still TBD what's going to happen with like nuclear weapons over the long term. So obviously there's major, major downsides to technology, major disruptions that happen at the moment. But over time, humans have been pretty good at harnessing better and better technology to make our lives better and better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you? I was going to pick up on one other thing you said about you know, the environmentalist movement, things like that. Did you read The Three Body Problem? Uh, I have I have read it a while ago and I'm going to watch the Netflix series, but I have, I have not seen it. So it's out of my uh, recent- Oh, uh, nice. I haven't seen the Netflix show yet, but I'm, I'm, I have just started the third book. Um, anyway, the first book, and I don't think it's going to spoil anything because it's in the first like 10 pages. One of the characters becomes extremely influenced by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And it essentially leads her to take a worldview that I think is like anti-human, right? Basically, she thinks like human beings are bad. They do bad things to each other. They do bad things to the planet. And perhaps it'd be better if they didn't exist at all. And she doesn't become so extreme, like she actively wants to kill people. But I think this like anti-human view is actually surprisingly prevalent yes. in the world, whether it's in terms of like anti-natalists, uh, extreme environmentalists, but it seems to be almost this return to like a pagan-like view that Mother Earth mm -hmm. is an entity and an entity that that kind of has more value than the actual humans that are on it. And rather than being able to exploit nature in conscientious ways to benefit humanity, we actually need to do everything we can to preserve nature which I, I think I would just define as anti-human. Interesting. Yes, this is a really interesting part where it's essentially, it's it's something I've been tracking for a long time in the spiritual nature of, of uh, divine father, divine mother, these two aspects of God that are essentially uh, so, somewhat different, but all kind of combine at the, at the highest level. Um, and it, it, one of the part, one of the reasons I like Buenos Aires and South America in general is that the Divine Mother is still a part of of the of the logos, I guess. Uh, um, and uh, and it seems like in the West, or at least in the Western mindset, the Divine Mother has been sort of, even though that Gaia Mother thing that you're talked about is purported as a large value has also been sort of uh, uh, hollowed out. Do you, uh, uh, That might have been somewhat cryptic, that whole thing. But if it was, please ask any questions. But what do you, do you agree or disagree with that? Well, you're saying what you like about Buenos Aires is they're still like treating nature as an entity? No, no. So this has to do with uh, like divine mother, sort of like the, and this is, it, it's not a very fleshed out thought because I haven't thought about this a lot, except inside my own mind where it's like- That's okay. Uh, Divine... That's what we're doing dialogue. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> That's what I love about it. Uh, D Divine Father, sort of like, you know, that Abrahamic uh, kind of God that's sort of masculine with the beard and stuff like that. And then Divine Mother is 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 the big fertility statu uh, statues that they found all over 
Europe and everywhere else where it's just kind of like this big fat mother uh, that is sort of like bountiful and, and, and all these different things. And so like the Gaia thing feels similar to that. And what I mean by the Gaia thing is the, is the, the, the image that you talked about, about this nature, this mother, this sort of like thing that's going to, that is limited, but the divine mother is not limited. It's, it's unlimited. Um, and there's sort of abundance. And so like both in Argentina, like Argentina is a very bountiful place. Uh, so there's ton, there's fertility here. There's tons of stuff here. There's land of milk and honey type of stuff. And but in the South American, Latin American type of thing, the divine mother is still a role. It's like the mother is still a role, like the ancient mother um, is still a role. So it's like there's this sweetness uh, to, that exists in South America mm. that I don't find. And do you think that comes with the many generations of intermarriage between like Western settlers and indigenous yeah. people? There's something there. Yeah, there's something there. And there's also something about the religion. It might have to do with the Protestant thing, because uh, the the Protestants never really made their way to South America. It was mostly um, uh, it was mostly initially Spanish, but then also Italian. Uh, there are some Germans and such, but they didn't ever have mm -hmm. that same kind of levels in the, in the, that existed in the United States. So it might also be something to do with the Catholic, but it also might have to do with the indigenous religions that became synchronistic with the Catholic as it, as it came here. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I like what you said. And just like Francis, I, I like myths and stories and legends. And I think that cultures that are rich in those tend to be interesting cultures that can really thrive. Um, but I perhaps would be helpful to make a distinction between what I call like lowercase w worshiping and uppercase w worshiping, Ooh, right? So the lowercase could be something like, this is a part of our culture, our heritage, our mythology. It's something we reference, we respect, we talk about. Seems great. D capital W worship would be like, who is the God that you actually serve, right? Mm. Worshiping is in like, I dedicate my life to this entity um, and doing what this entity asks of me. And for a long time, I, you know, I, I'm Jewish, I'm monotheistic, but I struggled to really understand like how important was the advent of monotheism in the world and what did that actually change? And the way that I interpret it is like we went from a world in which everyone could have their own God, that they're capital W worshiping, to sharing a God that oh. expects ethical behavior of human beings. Uh, so if you were an ancient Greek who's worshiping the goddess of like the moon, and I'm an ancient Greek who's worshiping the god of the sun, and you do something to harm me, I'm like, well, the moon god told you to do that, but my sun god tells me to do this, and we don't share a common ethics. But if we worship the same god, and that god has ethical expectations of us, like to behave a certain way rather than just to, you know, do what he wants um, in terms of his own praise and things like that, then we can develop a, a shared framework of morality, which I think leads to an explosion of like positive aspects of civilization. So, mm -hmm. so taking it all back to what you were saying, I'd say, I guess I'd be a little bit wary of the capital W worship of some mother nature like entity, right? Because it could signal that return to, I think what was a negative aspect of paganism, um, not sharing values, not having gods who expect ethical behavior from human beings. Um, but if it's a lowercase W worship of like, People here respect nature. They value fertility. They value the femininity, right? Those all sound like like positive things. This is really interesting. And it gets to what I've noticed inside of that Gaia, Mother Earth sort of um, new age uh, religion that has appeared inside of uh, the West and is very popular in California, uh, very popular in New York City, um, and is also spreading all over to the other major cities all around the world. Um, which is uh, the paganism, the return to paganism. Um, and and I have a lot of friends who believe in it and I think they're, you know, integrous people. I don't, I, like, there's nothing there really. Uh, uh, but in the sense, like, that, I, I really like what you isolated about the ethical framework that comes with a monotheistic take. Because I am, you know, I believe in there's one God. It's not many. There's There's one thing out yeah. there. Yeah. And I know a lot of people say like nowadays, especially I'm spiritual, but not religious. Yes, exactly. Probably high overlap in those types of people, the types of people you're describing. Uh, to me, religion equals spirituality plus ethics mm. plus community. Mm. And I think it's a combination of those three things. that's really vital. Like if you have spirituality without community, it's really hard for it to last. Like you need rituals yes, and that yeah. kind of thing to make it last. Mm -hmm. If you have even spirituality and community, but no ethics, like, What's the point of all that when it comes to the macro view of human civilization? 
Yeah, and that, that one's the hardest one recently in in the in these spheres that we've been talking about is the sort of without ethics, cultural relativism, groups of people all having values but not being explicit about those values and and just sort of like letting the, the wolves right in and 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 tearing yeah. it apart. Um yeah. it's and, like I have nothing against people who describe it that way if they say I'm spiritual yeah. but not religious. I would just be curious to know, okay, that describes spirituality, your relationship with something higher. But also tell me about your relationship with other people, community, and tell me about your relationship with values and ethics. This is great. Okay, let's let's zoom in on the ethics part. The ethics is thing is really interesting because there's a sort of meme over the past ten years where where somebody could have a career as an ethicist, uh, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of challenges there because um, it's like values, like there's the the values that we're explicit about, the values that we're implicit about, the values that we're totally unconscious about, um, and then. Uh, and then so a lot of times it feels like ethicists use this thing to basically create a career as an ethicist and then their jobs involved and then it all relates to like what the 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 the, the kind of mode or fashion is as well. Um, do you have any takes on how to navigate this tricky thing in terms of actually having ethics um, and also helping people understand ethics and such? I was just smiling because it sounds like a very interesting career. I mean, I assume it's like some subset of philosophy. Um, but I think one one struggle of human civilization has always been what rules do we impose upon each other versus ooh, upon ooh. only ourselves or our own yeah. like tribes or communities. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think that the United States, the founding of the United States, had a really radical innovation that we underappreciate, which is pluralism. Basically saying everyone in this country is free to do whatever they want. They can worship whatever God they want. They can say whatever they want. However, the only things you're not allowed to do are the things that are going to harm other people. Yes. And it's actually this brilliant, like logical solution to a really difficult logical problem of like, where do you draw those boundaries? Um, and I think it works beautifully. And obviously there's a big gray area of like, how do we define harm, right? What harms someone else? Well, what if I suddenly say you worshiping this God does harm me, right? Because it makes me unhappy. So Ooh. there has to be that clear definition that you have know, centuries of case law that we have, what is defining harm? And the gray area is right for exploration and reinterpretation. But overall, I think it's a system that works brilliantly. Yes. Yeah. And is facing maybe one of the biggest challenges that we're we've ever had. No, it's not, it's not, I don't, it doesn't feel like the biggest challenge that the United States has ever had, but it feels like a very strong challenge to the United States about what you just said, particularly related to what we were talking about earlier is the the spiritual, not religious type of thing. Um, and the sort of secularism that's taken over and I like secularism, I think is a um, interesting idea that there's something there in the back of secularism that's important, but, but I think it's also used for various things that are not healthy or helpful. Um, yeah. The way that I think about that is like the, the danger to the system, the danger of it being eroded has not come so much from rights being eroded as from redefining what harm means. Yes. Because then you're eroding all rights, right? So if originally harm meant like, I cannot punch you in the face, but now harm means if you tell me that I'm doing something you don't like is harming you, suddenly you erode all my rights. Cause you can say you worshiping this God I don't like is harming me. You saying this thing I don't like is harming me. And suddenly all rights have disappeared and it becomes totally subjective again. And then in these, when you have these kinds of rights becoming subjective, then I think you end up in societies that are more akin to what we had like middle ages and before of like highly, highly tribal homogenous yes. groups that are constantly at war with each other. Okay. Yeah. This gets into territory I've talked about many times on the show of essentially um, we seem to be entering where the, the broadcast mediums have now changed. So we started out with, you know, uh, magazines, publications being spread over a large period of time. And that's where, you know, Voltaire comes in and, and sort of like cr creating uh, or getting censored a bunch by the French government um, and then went to radio and radio allowed, you know, one person to speak to a millions and millions of people. And then TV where we had um, uh, the ability to speak with millions of people and show them images. Uh, and then that's now collapsed very quickly um, so that no one channel has millions, if not billions of people. Uh, there are, you know, viral uh, things that pop one message every once in a while. Uh, but for the most part, that seems to be crashing. And it feels like we're entering a very decentralized media landscape uh, where it's many to many. Me as one person can talk to many people and many people can talk to me. Um, and 
what do you think is going to be the effect of this on culture? Um, has this shown up in your work or your life at all? Yeah, it's a great question. I think overall, it's a really good thing. Um, I think that there's a little bit of moral panic around social media. Yes, I will caveat this and I'll get into the caveats momentarily because I'm also very critical of social media. And I think it's especially dangerous for children. But I think that the moral panic is overblown in the same way that the moral panic about radio is overblown, the same way the moral panic about the printing press is overblown. Like anytime there's a technology, these are all technologies that take power away from people, the power to disseminate their own information and distribute it more widely, make it more easy to do that. The people in power are not happy with it. Totally understandably, right? But um, in the long term, I think in the, in the short term, medium term, there could be a lot of disruption that can harm a lot of people. But in the long term, it's benefit for humanity if it's easier for people to transmit information to other people without having gatekeepers. And I often hear people talking about dangers of like misinformation, things like that, and bemoan the fact that we no longer have just three news stations that each have their own reliable anchor. That to me sounds like a terrible time. There are only three people in the world that people would listen to. I mean, like how could you possibly, possibly uncover the whole truth when everyone's only listening to three people and their own pre-approved narrative from like their own studio? Very interesting. Okay. So, and, and, uh, it, it reminds me of corruption, you know, like the, in th thousands of years of people talking about how absolute power corrupts absolutely and such. Uh, and, 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 and there's the, there's the, the large, um, like the three people being in charge of this, like, obviously that, that happened. It fe felt like it happened over, over the past few years and maybe even longer too. Um, uh, and now we're entering a world where no such, entity has that sort of power over the way things happen and 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 it reminds me of like the unknown unknowns like i'll go into how how my media sort of consumption and use is 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 changing i i love to use social media as learning um so it's a great way to do what i call spaced repetition memorization um, and spaced repetition memorization is based off of the fact that 90% of whatever we're going to talk about in this phone call is, is going to be gone within four days, unless there's a strategic reminder three days beforehand, and you can be very strategic about it, or you can just use social media and have the algorithm, uh, present this type of stuff passively. Um, mm. and so, uh, and so you, as I use this for this particular purpose, um, uh, social media allows me to reach a lot of different people. But if I think about it, I no longer have like somebody telling me what's important, except if I engage with them or except if the algorithm itself has detected a pattern and gives me more of those things. Um, and yeah, so, that, go for it. Go that, for that, that, that's worth picking up on. Like if someone is just replacing these three news anchors I trusted with this algorithm I trusted, <laughs> it's not that much better, right? Yeah. I think the internet is a tool where, like you said, you can consume it passively. In that case, it's not that much better. Yeah. Or you can consume it actively. Yeah. So one example I like to give is like, there's a lot of evidence that spending a lot of time online puts you in an echo chamber of like your own political beliefs. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. very easy to see how that happens. But if someone is motivated to not be in an echo chamber, the internet is the best tool in the world for them. So the example um, that I, I often give is if you want to Google something that you agree with, you will find endless sources that are backing <laughs> up your viewpoint, right? And you can memorize the facts and the arguments they're making. But if you want to learn about the other side, all you have to Google is why X is not true. And then you will see 10 search results that are basically the, the best 10 arguments against what you believe. So it's also easier than ever to see different sides of an issue. You just have to be willing and motivated to do that. Brilliant. Uh, and it gets into self-knowledge and how to know oneself. And not only from the, the like a lot of people, I think, confuse self-knowledge with knowing about our biography, our autobiographical self, as John Bravicki talks about. Um, and and there's a difference between that and knowing the self, which I would label as as a, a capital S, like the self that's related to the divinity and such. Um, but on that point, they're both related. The, the autobiographical self, that thing is... Um, you can know it re really well uh, and you can ask it questions like you said, like, how am I wrong about this? And that goes into the scientific method. There's this great YouTube series that I'm not going to be able to accurately source in this thing, uh, in this in this podcast, but um, there's a great YouTube channel that goes over the history of the philosophy of science um, and goes into 
uh, what is his name? Um, there's a guy who talks about um, how science is like punk rock. Uh, basically, it's like punk. It's very, it's very like it's not, it's not a group of people who are coming to these things. Like, yes, groups are important. The peer review can be important in some ways, um, but, uh, but it's like this loner, eccentric loner in the corner who's just like, screw all you. I'm, I'm gonna go check, check this out to see whether, it, whether it works. And, um, and like that's science, and that's where social media comes in, is because like if you can do what you're saying, which is not an easy thing. People have been trying for thousands of years and keep on getting stuck into patterns of, of illusion. Um, is like if you can know yourself, you can fact check yourself, uh, uh, and and that feels like a good thing to do. It feels like a good thing because it's all about reality and our nature with reality. As you said in the beginning, shared minds. Like if there's a if there's a bug in our mind, it's probably better to know it rather than not know it. Um, any ideas on that? Anything you want to discuss based on that? I like the the thread about science. Um, there are all these famous examples of scientists who made incredible discoveries, but first were not only disbelief, but like totally shunned, even ostracized from the scientific community. Um, like Watson and Crick is, is a good example. I think their own thesis advisor tried to sabotage their research because he thought oh, it was God. so bad. Um, so I actually think the pretty much the definition of a scientific discovery is something that at the time everyone else thinks is wrong. So uh, if you yeah. live in a society as institutions where as soon as something is heard that is wrong, it is suppressed or censored, or that person is sort of excommunicated from the, the elites. Um, you're never going to have innovation. I think it applies not only to science, but innovation in any area of the world in how we do um, politics and how we do education, how we do everything. The innovative idea at first is going to be something every single other person thinks is wrong. So I think the society that is going to most rapidly advance in terms of human well-being mm. is the one which is willing, at the very least willing, to engage with new ideas. Um, and of course, most of them are going to be bad. Right, most of the times that people think something is wrong, it's because it is wrong, and you don't want to waste endless energy debating the same wrong things over and over again. However, you can't also use that as an excuse to suppress everything that you think is wrong. Uh, it's so pertinent today, to today, uh, um, and and where this is all headed. The the most interesting thing that has popped up in the last year or so is the effective accelerationists, and which I believe has something to do with the effective. Altru altruist who you mentioned the EA stuff uh, uh but I'm not totally sure if that's that's accurate um the and uh, co compared with the degrowthers who are a large camp who are related to what we were talking about earlier with the Gaia earth and the and the sort of like this is very very limited resource we need to stop the humans so that we can save it um and the accelerationists are very interesting um because they want zero regulation and i'm more inclined to believe that zero regulation is probably more uh, uh, healthier than 100 regulation or even like 20 percent regulation that's done in a way that's really like uh ignorant um and so uh i don't i but i don't know yet and i like if i were to choose camps i would probably put myself in the ex effective accelerationist but i think they're also like if they're also headed for some really challenging things if they go full full into that. So there's like a, yeah. a source of disagreement that that I have with that. I haven't completely isolated yet. What, what's your take on this? It reminds me of like a, a meme that pops up frequently in like stories and, and myths too of like the totally amoral scientist who's like, mm -hmm. I'm just yes. making progress yes. for yes. progress's yes. sake and I'm not going to think about the ethical consequence of what I'm doing. Like the movie Oppenheimer is like a really good exploration. I don't know if Oppenheimer itself was the you know, prototypical amoral scientist, but it kind of poses that question. So I, I think that anyone who is leaning in that direction is like a little bit dangerous too, because <laughs> you don't, you can't necessarily, it's true, you can't necessarily always slow the advent of technology. Like yes. if you don't discover it, someone else might, that's yes. always true. But I don't think it's an excuse for just like not proceeding with caution and thinking about designing things in humane ways and the impact it's going to have on humanity. It's definitely not like, like all or nothing there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about uh, the, the degrowth thing and how people consume limited resources. Also, maybe think of another point. I don't think that energy is limited either. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people think, okay, well, we may not run out of food, we may not run out of space, but we are going to run out of energy. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is 
there's so much energy in the world. I became obsessed recently with potential energy. You know, like Ooh. you learn in high school physics. If a, if a boulder is at the top of a mountain, it has potential energy equal to, and I, I forget the formula, right? But it's basically like, you could just push the boulder down the mountain and you collect the, the energy it, it gives off while it's rolling down or the impact that it has at the bottom. So think about how much potential energy is just at the top of every mountain. If you cut off like the tip of every mountain on earth, and found some way to harness the energy by pushing it onto something or rolling it down something, that's already a ton of energy. Like, wait, it's even more potential energy than that in the universe because potential energy is just mass. Every planet, every uh, you know object in outer space has mass and its gravitation is pulling it, uh, other things towards it or it's towards other things. You can harness all that. So I'm envisioning a future in which we can basically just put other planets on treadmills and harness the energy from that. Oh, interesting. And it, I've seen I've seen some uh, whispers of uh, sort of like a, a jump in that step. There are two really interesting things that have come around. You might already know both of these, which one uh, one is uh, 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 putting satellites in space and collecting solar energy and then beaming them down with some sort of technology that I don't understand. Mm. Then there is um, another really interesting one, Varda. And I'll be interviewing Delian, who's one of the founders of, of Varda. What they're doing is they're putting... Um, uh, satellites into space, and then they're uh, manufacturing uh, crystals in space that have a different form of uh, um, that can only be grown in places where gravity is less, uh, mm. and and that they're going to apply those to HIV drugs. Um, and so there's these two examples of sort of like once, and this gets into the the sort of EA EAC type of thing, which is the Kardashev scale. Um, which is like w w how we can harness energy as a human being. I definitely, I think I'm, I agree with you that there is tons, tons of energy that is out there and we just need to be more innovative. And it also yeah. brings the It sounds to me like, like these are engineering problems, not limited resource problems. Mm. Like probably incredibly complicated engineering problems. And I'm not a physicist. I don't know if it's, you know, how, how complex we have to, to be in order to harness like the power of planets. But I think all this stuff is possible one day. I just have not seen any signs in history that our ability to improve our engineering and thus harness energy from new sources will slow down. If anything, it's actually sped up over time. And yeah. so if we run out of coal, if we even run out of natural gas, whatever, like not super worried, we'll sure we'll figure out how to harness something else. It's so interesting. And it goes into um, like, how, how did these thoughts get in my head of essentially that uh, and I know uh, once I asked that question, uh, it was all my childhood. It's all based on the people that are around me, like uh, put this thought in my head, but it was putting their heads in the same way, uh, which is just like, it's limited. The earth, the earth is going to, is going to die unless we, unless we, unless we do something now. And it's sort of, it goes back to the conversation about censorship as well, which is just like, uh, I know, I know it's going to die. And therefore I need to shut you up. Like you're, you're, you're dangerous because I know the truth. You don't know the truth. Uh, and I'm not saying this to you specifically, but like th that's the, the, the thing inside the head. It's like fear. And you, you, you said well, that, that tactic could be used on people on either side, right? It takes someone on the opposite side of the one that we're arguing against or someone who does want to like accelerate technology in, in a humane way, whatever. And they, they could use the same thing. They could say, well, the innovations I'm talking about are going to lead to massive prosperity and higher uh, lifespan for everyone and so forth. Therefore, like you have to shut up because you're trying to slow me down. So I think oh, we have to separate a little bit like the, the, the tactic from the ideology. Like people from any ideology can use any kind of tactics and there are lots of bad ones. Yes, interesting. But this and this is why it's so important to this for the censorship angle, also not censor things, <laughs> uh, but also not censor things that are... Um, uh, that are uh, agree ideologically with one side, what the side that I'm on, basically. Exactly. Because yeah. we want to have both the extreme, like return to nature people and the extreme accelerationist yes. yep. people and everyone in between hashing things out and debating um, and even like fighting in intellectual ways. Um, because I think that's over time how you arrive at the best possible solutions. Yes. And I have evidence for that. The evidence is similar to the population growth argument. The more there has been freedom of speech and freedom of information in society, the more society has flourished over time. And do you think the the nation state, we can go into the sort of network state type of things as well, but do you think the nation state that will most likely be the 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 the, the ground for this is the United States? Or are there other places that you're excited about that have that same idea? Hmm. That's a good question. 
um, I guess I know the most about the United States and I happen to be like obsessed with this, like the yeah. design philosophy of the United States. So I think it works really well. I'm sure other people can figure out other models that work really well, um, but it feels like over the past hundred years or so, other nations have been emulating the United States more and more. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing with the social media question is that we seem to be entering a world where um, uh, well, I, my take on it is that the United States uh, has had some challenges over the last few years in terms of our ability to match thought with action um, and 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 our values in the United States. And it, it seems really challenging at the at the federal level. For me, particularly the scariest thing uh, is that um, the bureaucracies uh, that are sort of unelected. And actually, uh, if you have design philosophy um, points on this, I would love to hear it, particularly around the bureaucracy and the growth of the bureaucracy and how much the founding fathers were aware of that the bureaucracy and how long, how much power it would eventually have once in the 1920s, the, 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 st the federal state started to just have a massive amount of power. Um, I would, I, I'd love to talk about that. Uh, there was a point though of, oh yeah. And, and, and so I think, um, uh, United States has the best system for it right now and has the longest tradition. Oh yeah, now, now I remember. So social media has spread that sort of can-do American dynam dynamism to other parts of the world, particularly in relation to the startup world. And there's a lot of you know challenges about just full-on ideological startup world type of thing. But, but I do think that that startup world represents a sort of American thing, the dynamic nature of it. And that feels like it's spread through this sort of network state to other places. Um, what's your take on that or the design philosophy? Yeah, I guess I have a thought on each. On the spreading, um, I think if it, if it is how you describe, it sounds like a good thing. Although this is one of my criticisms of like more freedom of information and internet. Mm -hmm. it, one of the downsides is it makes the worldwide culture more homogenous. Like you hear about how people all over the world are like listening to Taylor Swift and watching her movie. And there's something really beautiful about that. And there's also something really sad about that. Yes. Right? Like some amount of separation between cultures lets cultures preserve their yes. heritage, lets them even innovate on their own heritage, but in separate ways. When there's so much mixing, the risk is that it all just becomes the same. And if we become the same, then we just lose out on all the beauty of the potential different things that could have been developed. So that's like that's like my the one thing I kind of regret seeing how the internet proliferates information and culture is like. I regret that we don't have a culture halfway across the world that's not listening to Taylor Swift and is just doing entirely their own thing okay. musically. And then we see where we end up differently in a hundred years and like compare notes. Um, my thought on the design philosophy of the United States, I happen to agree with you. I think proliferation of bureaucracy is a bad thing. And I think one of the other big innovations um, that the founding fathers had in addition to pluralism was federalism. The idea that you should be most accountable to your local community, next most accountable to your city, next most accountable to your state, and lastly, to the, the entire nation, the federal government. Um, and they specifically designed a system in which the local government had the most power, then the state government, then the federal government. At least you know, 250 years ago, the federal government did not have that much power. And especially yes. under Thomas Jefferson, his whole philosophy was like, all the federal government is good for is an army and a post office. Wow. I think nowadays we don't even need a post office because we have private companies that handle mail and shipping even better than, than USPS. Um, so that, that happens to be like my political philosophy. But I think the general point there is something really perceptive about human nature, right? That we are, barring a term from Jonathan Haidt, who used to work with parochial altruists, we're much more likely by nature to be altruistic towards the people who are closest to us, mm -hmm. right? Our spouses, parents, mm -hmm. siblings, children, and then a little bit less altruistic towards people in our extended family, a little bit less towards our friends, a little bit less towards our community and so forth. And so the further out that people are separated by values, distance, whatever it is, just a less likely that our intrinsic human nature is gonna be like altruistic towards those people. Mm -hmm. And so I think the founding fathers were able to brilliantly harness that insight and say, okay, great. Let's have the strictest laws be the ones that bind you to the people who are physically closest uh -huh. to you. Yep. And the, the loosest laws, the ones that bind you to people who are geographically very distant from you. Um, halfway across the country. And it, you know, the, the, the most important laws that we have to enforce at every level are the ones that enforce pluralism, meaning you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't directly harm other people. Interesting.
so there's a there's a point there about the the what you said about the large scale migration of ideas across the the social networks and how that leads to the mono um monoculture. Uh, I agree. And it relates to what we talked about the patchwork age in terms of the um the 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 fracturing of our sort of collective conscious groupings based on the different media platforms. And it feels like that monoculture thing is going to last for a bit longer but then once these sort of like once the the tr the once the narrowing or the fracturing of this this happens then it seems like it might lead to some sort of um like evolution again in terms of those microcultures basically so that in a, maybe a thousand years or something like that we're, we are going to have uh wholly different ones that barely interact with each other and and uh, so that's really interesting. Why do, you, why do you think they would barely interact with each other? Won't they all be sharing the same internet? So yeah, so the, well, this gets into the, the internet and, and like I, I there's the this patchwork age idea. I got that from investigating a particular distributed computing paradigm that uh, some people are working on uh, called Urbit, which has now recently had a schism and that there's now another entry into this who are thinking about it. And there's also other other ones as well. Uh, all based on distributed computing because they feel like the walled gardens of the current social media landscape is just a temporary um, foray into um, uh, in, into large walled gardens, uh, centralized corporations, and that the internet will be much more decentralized again in the same way that it was in the '90s. Um, and uh, and so you asked me why. Uh, why I think they'll they won't be able to communicate, and I think it has something to do with that. That once the internet the internet is going to fracture again, like in the same way that the media, and so there won't be that much cross pollination between these two things. But I'm not sure on that, and that's that's something I want to I want to investigate more. Is like, and that might be very far away too, like past after I die, essentially. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I was thinking. If we do continue to say, share the same internet, if that doesn't happen in the short term, it might actually be a good argument for having a fourth branch of government. And I would call it like, basically there, there'd be local, state, federal, and digital. Because oh, part of federalism yeah. was this idea of like, how much space, physical space do we share with each other? If we don't share that much physical space, like we don't affect each other that much, the laws could be looser. Well, digital space, we all share that together. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy. It's like you share the same city with everyone in your city, but you also share the same internet with everyone in every city. Um, and I think that although I am in general a federalist and think government should be smaller, I could be in favor of adding a fourth branch of government. Yeah, that's super interesting. Is there anyone talking about this? Uh, is there anyone trying to influence this in, in D.C.? That's a good question. I don't know. This right now is just like an idea. I'm sure other people have had this idea before. And the way that I've seen it most expressed is a little bit different. It's just like technology is big and scary. We need more regulation. That's a part of it that I'm just like philosophically mostly opposed to because that basically what they're just saying is more power to the federal government. They're not talking about yes, having yes, a different branch yeah, of government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. That's very tense because it's like in the US, it's like in order to enact something like that, you would need to know how to play the game uh, at the federal level. And it, the answer might, well, but 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 given the US's sort of laboratory for experiment, it might maybe at the state level, but there's there's the, the you have to involve the federal government in in whatever you create. So there's gonna be there's that's it's a really interesting idea. Would you think like like some of the differences here, let's say between the federal branch and the digital branch would be the federal branch, like we all share bo the border of the United States. And so the federal government has to protect the border. Like we need a military, uh, right? That That's a very clear use case for the federal government. Is it a military to protect the border we all share? Okay, the yeah. digital world, obviously we don't need a military, but we do share digital space with people halfway across the country. So we need to have some kind of framework for how you define harming other people, like what laws are we all accountable to. But I would say, just like we have this for state, local, and federal, we need three branches of government in the digital space. There has to be a, a you know legislative branch that comes up with the laws, uh, executive branch enforces them, and a judicial branch that adjudicates them. Fascinating. Okay, we got about five minutes left. Uh, there is a. a... Can we uh, dial into the? Are you aware of? 
the 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 more into the 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 bureaucracies and how that happened my my take on it is that it happened not only in the United States but it happened everywhere in the world around the time that FDR uh, started to to have more influence and more power and related to that to that war um uh can you do you know anything about what the founding fathers projected about this bureaucracy and maybe the ways that they got it wrong? Well, I think one, yeah, I mean, I, I think one aspect that probably got wrong was just like how much it could grow. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing they got right was like intentionally trying to add gridlock to the system. So you probably hear people a lot saying nowadays, like they've been the fact that like Congress can't get anything done yes, because everyone's yes. just so divided. Like it's kind of the whole point. Like the whole system was designed so that nothing would get done <laughs> unless there's an overwhelming consensus that it's the right thing to do. Like you need the, the two thirds majority, you need this, you need that. You need all three branches of government to agree on it, right? Like basically government should be very slow to catch up with the advances of society. Once society has reached a point that there's overwhelming consensus of the right thing, then the government should enact it, but not the other way around. Because otherwise you have that danger of a small number of people like setting the shaping lives of a, a large number of people. Okay, that's really interesting. Because we could compare it with some somewhere like China, which is usually when they when people say that this is the problem with our government. Look at how well China can do with with uh, quickly establishing something and changing that. And 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 maybe with these large bureaucracies, maybe it's actually more effective if you have a small group of people. Uh, it but large bureaucracies don't seem like the way of the future. Like it seems like a lot of the bureaucracies are about to have a lot, a lot of problems because they move really slow and people enabled with artificial intelligence will have less coordination costs between humans uh, mm -hmm. because their, their, their individual augmentation is going to be so vast. Um, yeah. So, yeah. There's actually this um, management philosopher who I'm a fan of called Michele Zanini. He wrote, wrote a book called Humanocracy. But basically his theory is like, this whole middle layer that exists at companies and of course in government too, just isn't necessary anymore. Like the middle manager, like their job was to coordinate the flow of information. It was really necessary because you did have the big bosses at headquarters and then you have the local people in your local branch and you need to have some person who's aggregating all information, reporting it, et cetera, um, and flowing down orders from the top. But nowadays with like email, like it just yeah. is not necessary anymore. It's not to say that managers are not necessary at all. He definitely doesn't go that far, but he's talking about this kind of bureaucracy that was developed for a very specific purpose that was necessary before we had communication tools like email and now is no longer necessary. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. And how does that relate to, in your idea of um, fast growing tech companies that scaled because it felt like the institutional inertia was you need to get as big as possible. You need to hire as many people as possible, as many smart people as possible. But then it all ends up in the same place where Google has, you know, 100,000 employees or whatever. I don't know how many they have, but they have a huge amount of employees and they can't deploy things as quickly as OpenAI. Um, uh, but then OpenAI is doing the same thing where they're growing really quickly. So it's like, uh, do you think that that's going to end? Do you think that startups will be one to 150 people and then never grow above 150 people? That'd be interesting. I mean, it seems like the trajectory of most successful companies is as they get successful, they get bigger. And eventually they're so big that they can no longer be successful. Um, I started my career in management consulting. And remember my company had done some study of how many companies that reach a certain size survive for more than like 50 years. And it was like a tiny, tiny fraction of them. And basically the implication was once you get to a certain size, it's really hard to remain successful for all the you know, reasons that you, that you gave, right? Yeah. Like you can't innovate, you have all this bureaucracy, communication burden, all that stuff. Um, and so the interesting deposit, if you are a startup that is doing really well, what is the way to counteract that problem? There's a theory that I'm a fan of that, that someone I work with, Oren Hoffman is positive, which is like, maybe you should just keep spinning out companies. Like every time you develop a product, once it gets to a certain stage, a certain level of success, you just spin it out into its own company. And you end up having created like a hundred different companies that are all doing very well instead of one massive mega corporation that can dominate for some duration of time, but eventually will crumble under its own weight. And for that, I think it's really important to have the incentive, figuring out the incentive mechanisms between all the different companies, all the different spin outs. Uh, one great example of this is, is um, Google and uh, what was their company name that be became before Pokemon Go? There was um, Niantic. Uh, Niantic, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Niantic. Niantic. Uh, they were originally, they spun out of Google uh, and then they later then they became their own company, which, which is very, very successful company now. Um, and, uh, and so that, but like 
how do you connect those companies after they've spun out so that the original entity has some sort of uh, value that's garnered out of it and that they stay connected in this way? I think that's the that's the interesting. And do you even need that? Do you even need that? Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I like that you brought this up because I'm, I love Pokemon and I played Pokemon Go as well. Um, and I thought it's such a cool story, not only for the, the spin-out reason you mentioned, but it was originally based off an April Fool's joke. I don't know if you remember this, but, oh, but, yeah. but every year Google does like a big April Fool's joke. And one day the April Fool's Day joke was like, you could catch Pokemon in the real world using Google Maps. And then they're like, wait, what if we actually Oh, that's this? great. Oh, that's great. I love those. I love those stories. So this is the, a good way to tie it together. This is a message for everyone who thought my planets on treadmills thing was a joke. It's starting out as a joke, but one day maybe. <laughs> well, okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And if people are interested in, in what you presented or what you talked about today, how can they um, find out more about you? Uh, I guess best ways on LinkedIn. Um, I typically respond to messages there. So my LinkedIn is my name, Rafi Grinberg, R-A-F-F-I, last name G-R-I-N-B-E-R-G. Great. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.